This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 22. Let's move into sales. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. When Ramsey came to Canada from Lebanon, he lived off of donuts and Mars bars because he didn't know how to cook. Thankfully, he knows a thing or two around the kitchen nowadays. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, SE Nation, and welcome to another episode of We The SEs, or We The Sales Engineers, whichever you prefer. Thank you guys for being here. Before we jump into the actual interview, um, I have uh, an announcement to make, if you want to call it that. Basically, we know that there's a shortage of SEs out there, and the fact of the matter is most companies want SEs with experience. But it still happens that a lot of companies actually do hire SEs that don't have experience or they're moving in from a different position. could be professional services or engineering, whatever it is. So I am running a webinar on September 29th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern to discuss that, basically, to just provide a, f- a guidance to as many people as possible on if you want to go into sales engineering, what you should be doing, how you should act. We all know that getting into sales engineering is not easy. It's going to take a lot of work, maybe a couple of years of work, maybe more. So this webinar is just supposed to help you help as many people as possible. Uh, right now, I have a limit of 100 people who can join the webinar, first come, first served. I will have the Uh, webinar registration page open soon and when it's time for to actually have the webinar the first 100 people to log in will be allowed in if someone drops out then somebody else can log in that's just the way zoom works anyways uh let's jump into the interview let's talk about it a little bit today's interview is with bob emberly bob has been doing this for a long time he's been in se since Nine, he was in SE since 1995, then he switched to sales. And we were going to discuss a lot of things. We are going to discuss the career path for sales engineers. Uh, a lot of them go into, end up going into sales, so we're going to discuss that, what are some of the surprises, and how we could be good salespeople as well. And I don't want to ruin the show by telling you everything here, so let's jump into the show. Hey, guys. Sorry, it's still me. Uh just want to point out that I had the recording done with a very good microphone on my end and uh, I lost pretty much all recording everything that we had even the interview with Bob I lost that but luckily we had the backup and Zoom records the conversation and stores it locally on my PC so I have that it's not the highest quality audio I apologize about that but hopefully the nuggets are still there but you might hurt your ears a little bit. Let's get into the show. Hey, Bob. We're recording. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Ramsey? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for coming on the call, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate that you reached out to me. So if we can start off by maybe introducing yourself, letting us know who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, my name is Bob Emberley, and I've been uh, both an SE as well as a sales engineer for, gosh, almost 30 years now, I guess. So um, I'm originally from the, from the East Coast, from the Boston area, but I've been in Silicon Valley since 1993. Um, the first half of my career, I, I was in various technical roles including SE and SE manager. And for the past 18 years or so, I've, I've, I've been a, a sales manager. All right, great. So, uh, and to be clear for everybody, a sales manager is an account executive, kind of just a different terminology for it, right? Um, I think different, different industries and different companies have, have different nomenclature that they use. Um, my my technical title right now is senior regional sales manager or rsm 
Um, in the past, I've been called an account manager or an account executive. Um, usually just the sales guy is, is uh, what's commonly known as. Right. Uh, so maybe I just wanted to point out that you like manage accounts more than you manage people. Uh, Oh, exactly. Yeah, I'm. I'm a. I'm a direct sales guy. I'm. I'm the guy who deals with the customers. Um, I'm not a, like a, a area director managing other salespeople. All right. So, so you were an SE and then an SE manager, and now you have been an account manager for a long time as well. Um, what made you choose to one go from SE to SE manager and two go from SE manager to an account manager? So most of my early career, well, I, I was an engineer for a while doing like analog design work and CPU design work. Um, but I, um, I moved into a, a professional services group where we did a lot of uh, different custom either software projects or um, just, just on-site professional services kind of projects. And so I got to travel a lot and see a lot of different um, customers and work, work with a lot, of different, a lot of different sales guys. And I was in a startup, and I, I really liked the business side of things and growing a business. So I actually, um, I was a program manager for a while, and I, I built the business plan to start up a West Coast professional services organization for my company. And that's how I moved from Boston to Silicon Valley. So I, um, I actually learned how to write a business, write a business plan. And I, I, I looked up how to do it and read a book about it. And I wrote a business plan justifying this smallish company to move me to the West Coast and, and have me have a team and hire people out here. So um, I really just like the business side of things. And so I, I have a technical background, but I really just gravitated towards businesses and building businesses and um, I think sales, technical sales, is a is a good uh, a good combination of the two. So, uh, just to clarify, that was like in 1993 when you did that. <laughs> um, I worked in a professional services group from 1990 to 1995, and I moved from Boston to Silicon Valley in '93. Okay, so in 1995, you learned on your own to do a business plan. Keep in mind, there was no Google at the time. Is that, like, you basically have to go to the library and stuff and do this? <laughs> yes, that's true. Physical books right. and, uh, yeah. Wow. So it's doable without the internet. Okay, oh my God. That's <laughs> mind-boggling. All right, so you decided to go, you wanted to do the technical sales thing, which is basically NSE. Is that correct? Yeah, so I... Um, I mean, I, I went to several, I spent most of my career at startups where they're like, I was uh, employee number five at a very small company. And so I wasn't just the SE manager. I was the SE. I was the uh, travel planner. I was the uh, event coordinator. I was, you know, you, in a small startup, you do everything like that. And so I actually, uh, you know, was kind of involved in all aspects of the company. So I really liked I really liked that and learning a lot about getting a business off the ground. Um, so everyone always said, Oh, Bob, you should go into sales. You'd be good at sales. And I, I didn't make the jump until 2000. So five years later. Yeah. Uh, so in the startup, you were doing the technical, you were doing everything, but you also had an account manager or a sales guy helping you out or did, were you also doing both sides? No, I, well, I never officially did both sides. I, I, I always had a, a clear cut title of, of sales versus um, SE or back then we called it FAE for field application engineer. Um, but in 2000, when, when I, when I went into sales and officially changed my title, I thought I could still do the, do the FAE role as well and do both. Um, because I knew the products very, very well and I enjoyed doing the technical support stuff too. So I thought that I could do both roles because I thought a sales guy didn't do much. He, the sales guy 
took customers out to lunch, um, you know, didn't work long hours and the sales job would be easy. So I could do that on top of being, being an SE like person. And how did that work out for you? But I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> so I, uh, I quickly realized, uh, that the, the being a salesperson is a, is a full-time job and has all kinds of different responsibility and stresses that I, I didn't see as an SE. So I, I think I tried wearing both hats for about a week and I realized I, I, I can't do this. Um, I can't do both jobs effectively. I really need to rely on my SE to do the technical activities and I need to focus on, on the sales and business activities. So what are two or three things or as many things as you can think of that SEs like myself don't know that salespeople do? Is there any, like what, what surprised you when you did the switch? Well, um, as an SC, I felt like I, I had more control. I felt like if there was a customer issue or there was a, a demo to prepare or, or something technical t to get done, that I could get that problem done, that I could focus on it and either through something I automate or something that I, I do through brute force, I could get that task done. I might stay up late and it might take a lot of hours, but I, I knew how to do it and it was all within my control. As a sales guy, you're trying to get other people to do things um, and not be too pushy about it. You know, you need to um, combine your your personality traits and, and, and your sales skills to um, encourage customers to buy your product and to work with you. And so, I found as a sales guy, I was still up at night. I just wasn't in front of a keyboard typing in a solution to a problem. I was up at night worrying, what should I be doing to meet my sales targets? What, what, could, I be, what could I do tomorrow um, to increase the activity in my territory? What, what should I be doing? So there's, it goes from a very kind of finite universe that you control to a infinite universe that you can't control. And there's just a whole bunch more things you can or should be doing um, to build your pipeline and to work with your customers and to build up, to build relationships and to get your customers comfortable in placing an order with you. So you're going from something that where, sense? yeah, no, it does make sense. I, I agree and disagree with you in certain aspects. I agree with like you have more control while you're doing the demo, especially if the account manager doesn't know what's happening or doesn't understand the technology. So you're in control of that, but you're also less in control because you don't know what the sales manager is doing to get the, like I'm doing this POC, what's the sales manager going to do after to close the deal? So yeah, but I'm not, I don't have as much risk on the line as the sales manager. So I agree with that. So. Yeah. It's kind of like, I, I heard someone describe it once, like you're the, as a, as like a territory salesperson, you're the, you're the CEO of your company for that region and for those customers. You have this company behind you with engineers and developers and marketing guys and executives that are small, big company, but you're the CEO of your territory. You're, you're in charge of what you're going to do tomorrow. You're in charge of what meetings you're going to have, what promotional activities you're going to do, what meetings, you know, you're in charge of everything. So you're, and it's your job to corral and, and, to um, organize the resources you have at your disposal behind you uh, to make certain things happen. So it's, I see it as, as kind of like your, your, your own CEO of your territory. What would you call the SE in relationship to the CEO? I guess kind of like my VP of engineering. I mean, he's, um, he or she is going to be, um, in charge of, of over, overcoming the technical obstacles, um, either through discussion or a proof of concept or a demo. But um, as a CEO, I need to delegate. And you know, there are certain things that I, I can't do or shouldn't be doing that the, 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 the SE can. You know, that's part of their job.
Okay. Yeah, they, the other big difference I tell people when you're going from SC to sales, the big difference is that customers stop calling you back. <laughs> yes. So customers want to talk. Customers want to talk to their SE because the SE is going to help them do their job and complete their, you know, whatever technical tasks they have. Where, um, oh no, the the sales guy wants something from me. The sales guy wants a PO from me, or the sales guy, you know, wants to meet my boss. Um, so often, sales guys get uh, don't don't get return phone calls, and and often engineers avoid the sales guy. And I think that's part of um, that's an obstacle, something you need to overcome going into sales that you need to understand the, the, the different mindset and you need to kind of have a thick skin, but you also need to realize that people don't like to be sold, but people like to buy. So people say, Oh, I'm having fun this weekend. I'm going shopping. I want to go, I want to go buy stuff. I want to buy a new car. I want to buy new clothes, but no one likes to go to like a used car dealer and have someone sell them something that they don't want or to be pushy and, and so it's part of being um, a trusted advisor. So I'm like a, I'm an expert sharper in my, in my space and I can help my customers make good decisions and help them solve their problems. So it's more of a consultative sale and I'm helping my customers um, solve their problems and make good buying decisions. So how do you build trust if the customer doesn't call you back? Well, they have to have a problem. Um, they may not tell you on the first phone call what the problem is, but um, if you keep trying to get in contact with someone and they're not calling you back, they, they, I, I find either they, they don't have a problem, they trust someone else to solve their problem, um, or they don't have money and they don't want to waste your time. So um, it depends. So it's, Usually if someone has a problem and you generally have a good idea if you have, if they have a problem that you can help them with, um, usually at some point they'll, uh, if they don't call me back, I'll offer them an out and I'll, I'll, I'll send an email, I'll leave a message and say, um, I'm sorry, I've been trying to get a hold of you. I've, I've been maybe too persistent. Um, I don't want to be, be a pain in the neck, but can you tell me if you still have this problem or, if you've already found a solution or, you know, give me some feedback and I'll stop, I'll stop calling you and sending you emails. So be self-conscious about the fact that you might be bugging them and put it out there before they do. Yeah. I mean, it's, unfortunately it's a stereotype that the sales guy is annoying and calling all the time, but that's not really my sales style. That's not, I don't think that's in my personality to be too much of a pe too much of a pest. I mean, if I'm trying to reach someone that I don't know, I'm not going to send them emails every day and, and multiple times a day and, and be all of their case. You know, I, I send a few subtle emails and I, I try to include some interesting content. Like I, I try to change it up some and say, um, I'm working with a customer uh, in the same industry as you, and this is how I've helped them. Or I invite them to a free seminar or webinar or, you know, I, I try to mix up the message a little bit, not just say, can I meet with you? But I try to add value. So if he does open the email, he's going to get something out of it. So from my experience with limited amount of salespeople, almost most of the salespeople that I've met are not that stereotype pushy salespeople where they're just bugging people over and over. And it is a kind of a stigma that you guys get, uh, which kind of sucks for someone who was an SE who's considered helpful to move into sales and now all of a sudden you're no longer helpful. You're kind of uh, a pushy sales guy. Um, from a mental standpoint, how do you overcome people not liking you as much as they used to? <laughs> I don't know if it's liking or not, but uh, well, I think, I think I'm, um, I have my own brand. Like I, I've been uh, visiting Silicon Valley since 1990. I visited Cisco when they were private and a few hundred people. Um, so I, I've been working in Silicon Valley for what's that? 28 years. Um, and you run, you tend to run across the same people again and again. 
And so you need to be respectful of people, treat people like you'd want to be treated and, and always be kind of a, 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 be fair, treat them with respect um, because you're going to run into them again. So I think even though my role has changed over that period, um, I haven't changed. Um, I, I have customers today that I've had for, for 20 years across three, four different companies on both sides. Um, so it's, uh, I don't think it's that they don't like you anymore. They may have less reason to talk to you if they don't have budgets or they don't have, you know, they're, they're not buying anything, but, um, you know, we're still, I still have good professional relationships with people that, um, have spanned both job titles. Okay. So be yourself. That's yeah. Okay. Right. So it took you from 1995 to 2000 to do the switch. And that's because people were telling <laughs> you that you should, you would be a good sales guy. How do you know that you're ready to make that switch? Right. Um, Well, over that time, I, I was at maybe two or three different startups. Um, and being a sales guy at a brand new startup is one of the toughest jobs you can have because nobody knows you. Uh, you don't have any reference customers. You don't, <laughs> you may not have much of a product yet. Um, you're, you're the new guy and just trying to get a meeting can be impossible. So because I was at startups, because of my love of, of building businesses, um, those were tough environments to, to start a sales career. So I, I often saw other sales guys who, who would come in and try to sell stuff and, and struggle who were very experienced and it, it's, it's not easy. So I was looking for the right opportunity to, to go into sales and one of the startups that I was at was acquired by a bigger company um, that was pre IPO, but about to go IPO, there may be 300 people or so. And the, uh, the sales director there was someone that I, that I had known for 10 years and also had been an SC before. Um, and we were good friends outside of work and he said, this guy's leaving the company. I have an opening on my team. Do you want to join my team? And I knew the guy that was leaving and I knew the product, the product really well. And I knew the pipeline and the customers for the territory. So it was pretty easy to transition at that point. So everything was all lined up. So I, I knew the company, I knew the manager, I knew the product, I knew the pipeline. It was a startup, but it was growing very fast and getting ready to go IPO. So um, we had some customer successes. We had good products. We had pipeline. Um, so I felt like this is a really good opportunity to make the jump. If I can't be successful at this role, um, you know, th this is my best chance for success. So is it the fact that the opportunity came up that made you think about going to a sales role or were you thinking about going to a sales role and then this opportunity came up? More the latter. I mean, it had always been back in my mind. It was just like when, and when I was at a smaller company at 10 people, um, without established products, like this isn't the right time. Um, and it's hard to go from being an SC at one company to be a sales guy at another company. Um, people generally want the higher experienced salespeople at the destination company. So that, that's, that's a hard way to make the jump. But within the same company, you're a known quantity and they, they, they have a good feel for whether or not you're going to be successful at sales or not. And so I was asked to take that role and it was a good time to do it. So what got you to the point where you thought it was time to move on to the other role? Um, basically, what I'm trying to do here is get, so there's a lot of SEs out there, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later. There aren't that many options for us to move up for, like, in a SE world. Like, you, you can only become an SE, SE manager, director. There's only one SE manager for every, uh, maybe, 20 SEs. 
and then uh, director for every three uh, managers. So there isn't that much leeway to go up. So most SEs would want to go into sales or we'll, like some other options. How did you how did you know that it was time for you to go into sales and not something else? So I think, like I said, I I had been thinking about sales. People had been people had been advising me, hey, you'd be good in sales. You should go into sales. So it was it was it was always in the back of my mind, waiting waiting for the right opportunity, and the right opportunity came up. Um, I mean, I think you're talking about the opportunities, you know, the ratio of SEs to SE managers and such. Um, the thing with, with sales guys is there, there tends to be pretty high turnover in general in the industry. The sales guys are either killing it and doing great and, and they love it or they're struggling and they don't last very long and they move on. Um, so I think the, Turnover rate for sales guys in general is much higher than than for SEs, um, and, and even if the sales guy leaves on his own or is asked to leave, um, there's a lot. There's there's very high pressure, constant pressure every quarter, every month to perform, and it's it's a tough treadmill to be on, and and either the company management lets you go or you leave on your own if you're not happy. So. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to go into sales for people who are experienced SEs and know the sales process, know the products. I think it's, it's a very natural, a natural transition if that's what you want. That being said, I think there's nothing wrong with staying being an SE um, if you enjoy it. And I, I know people who are in their fifties have been SEs basically their whole life. Um, and they enjoy it and they, I think there's enough, um, there's enough variety in the, in the SE type roles and technical roles that you never, you never get bored or I don't, I don't, I think you can stay in SE, basically what I'm saying, you know, I don't, or an SE type type role. Um, you can do that for a long time, very stable job. If you're, if, and if you're enjoying it, you don't need to change. Right. Yeah. No, I don't know a lot of SEs as well that, have been in their as have been SEs and will retire as SEs because they love it so much. It is a very fun job, which is why I started doing this podcast because you know it's a interesting job. And you're right, there's a lot of variety in some cases. In some cases, you're just saying the same stuff over and over. Uh, okay, so for those who want to move up, move away, or do something other than SEs, in your in your experience, what do you see SEs? who don't stay as SEs become at a later uh, date? I, I'd say, I'd say half or over half going to sales. Um, I'd say that's the most common, common path. Um, I know, I know three SEs that are now CEOs of their own companies. Um, so you can go right up to starting your own company um, I think a lot of that is the fact that I've been at startups where people have this uh, yearning for entrepreneurship and, and like startups. And so um, I think the nature of the people I've been around, um, a lot of the SEs are very business oriented and go into either sales or business development or um, start their own companies. Were they successful? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but I mean, sometimes like for a while I was on this cycle of you go from startup to startup where startups by their nature are very unstable. Either they, either they, either they go out of business quickly or, or they get acquired to go IPO fairly quickly. Um, so a lot of people I, I know were these serial startup people and that was probably one of them where you go to a startup for two to four years and then you look for the next one because it's been acquired by a bigger company and it's changed and you want the, the excitement of a startup again. So it's, um, it's a cycle that a lot of my peers were on for quite a while going from startup to startup. And it's quite easy to do 
especially here in Silicon Valley. Okay. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about the, the good and the bad, the ugly of working at startups. But do you think of any other possibilities for SEs to move from that role? Um, I mean, I think I think if you're if you're very technical, you, you can go into a development kind of role. But I think if you're already an SE, you may already be off that deep technical track of being a developer or a, a developer um, working in engineering. So I, I think from SE, you can go anywhere you want um, on the sales and marketing and management side, for sure. So t technical marketing, you can do uh, product marketing, you can do um, a lot of companies have dedicated proof of concept labs. You can be a, a POC engineer. Um, for a while, I was kind of a, um, a specialist that was just brought in to major opportunities. And I would travel the world going to different places just as a, as a very high level specialist, which was pretty cool. I got to travel a lot through Europe and Asia. Um, and so I, I think the opportunities are quite, quite broad. Um, but if you have that the technical and business background. Okay. So uh, before we move on to the next topic, you mentioned that I mentioned something in my previous podcast, and I'm going to give the listeners some context here. Uh, I had said the management treats SEs as adults, and they treat account managers as kids, as in they keep calling and checking, did you do your job, did you do your job, did you do your job? And uh, you don't like that. You don't like that comparison. So by all means, correct me. Well, again, it's an opinion. It's not right or wrong. But I've I've been an SE manager, and I've been an SE, and I've been a a sales guy for a long time. And I think um, on the technical side, um, yes, you're treated as an adult, but the the scope or range of your activities isn't as broad and there's not as much um, upper management doesn't have as much concern about are you preparing for that demo properly or are you supporting that customer properly um, I mean I think that you work with your with your sales manager with your account executive and you kind of have your priorities for what what you should be doing each day or each week kind of where your focus should be uh, but the uh, your 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 sales manager, or even even your SE manager, doesn't isn't going to say, well, um, how, how how are you solving this customer's problem? Are you doing it the right way? Um, a manager may say, do you need any help? Can we get any other resources to help you? But they're not going to say, don't do it this way, do it that way. The reason why the sales guys often get bugged by management is because we're we're the front line generating revenue that runs the business and so there's a lot of different activities a sales guy does that directly impact the bottom line revenues um, if you're a public company you know, hitting hitting quarterly goals is very important to the company and the sales guy has a lot more decisions and options to make that are going to impact the top of the mansion of the company. So I think it's fair for sales management or executives to go to a sales guy and say, what are you doing to close this deal? We see in the forecast, you have a, a half million dollar opportunity with this account and that's forecast and close at the end of the quarter. How confident are you that that's going to close? And what are you, what are you doing to make that happen? Um, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot more, reason for management to question a sales guy about what you're doing. Now that being said, I, I, I've been in companies where I sat next to the CEO and he would ask me, ask me for status four times a day and tell me what I should be doing, which is awful. That's like being treated treat like a child. And I've been in companies where my sales manager would ask me once every three months um, for for a forecast and then he'd leave me alone because I was meeting my numbers and he was happy with my performance. There's no questions. So I think being treated like a child is a little extreme of a description. Um, and it depends on your 
immediate manager. And then I do think there's a lot more reason and justification for management to be questioning the sales guy because it impacts their bottom line and things that report to their shareholders and their stock price. Well, I agree with you on pretty much everything you said. Uh, basically, okay. my experience, brief experience, I, I didn't like the way I was treated. Uh, and also, they do have the, the, a reason to question you to make sure that everything is going well. And because pretty much everything a sales guy forecasts today, it goes up all the way to the, the CEO who wants them to brief the board at some point. So, yeah, the, the visibility is higher for an account manager. So, I agree with you. Yep. Yeah. So, we were talking before about startups and working at startups. Uh, what's what's the good thing about working for a startup and what's the bad thing about working for a startup? And how do you know if it's for you? I like startups because there's a lot going on. Um, the pace is very fast. Um, you get to do a lot because there's only a few people to do everything that needs to be done. And so uh, you get exposed to many, many more things than you do in a larger company. Um, yeah, some, some of it may not be fun, but you get exposed to the whole thing and someone's got to do, someone has to do every job and, and you step up and do what you can do. So you get to, like I believe in general in life, like when you come out of high school, you, Generally, you don't know what you want to do with your life. Like I wasn't in high school and said, I want to end up in high tech sales. The way you find out what you want to do is by trying different things and seeing what you like and don't like. And, and just, it's a lot of uh, trial and error. So a startup, which you try a whole bunch of jobs at the same time um, and see what things you like and what things you don't like. And so it's a way to kind of test drive lots of, of roles on a company. Uh, what's bad is that it is, it can be very stressful. It can be long hours. Um, it can be very frustrating because you're not getting traction. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, you get a rush or a high when you get any, any PO at all. Um, but when you can't get meetings and you can't make sales at all, it, it can be very depressing, uh, very, depressing and challenging to go to work and stay motivated. So it's, it's a quite a roller coaster. Okay. And is there a difference between say like working at a startup or working in Silicon Valley? Um, well, a lot of startups are in Silicon Valley and most of my experience in startups has been Silicon Valley, or, although I, I was in one, um, I was in a couple of startups in the Boston area as well. I think for, for high tech sales and high tech startups, the density of prospects and customers in Silicon Valley is so high. There's just so much activity here. Uh, you don't need to get on a plane or drive very far. Um, this is kind of, Silicon Valley is kind of ground zero for, for any kind of um, technical startup to face customers. So um, that's probably the reason why I moved here to Silicon Valley was all the customers are here. Um, but you, like one of the startups I was at where I said I was like employee number five, they're based in Massachusetts and I was the only guy here in Silicon Valley. So um, I had this team writing code for a product back in Boston and I'm out here facing customers on my own. And even my, my boss who was VP of sales would, would come out once every three weeks, but I was out on my own facing customers, uh, trying to get a startup off the ground. So, uh, I think startups can be independent of Silicon Valley, but so much of the business is here. That's where a lot of the startups are. So you, you mentioned that working for a startup is hard because, People don't know about you, and you know it's hard to get traction. So, and you did that. You worked for a startup; they didn't know about you. You were the only guy in Silicon Valley. How did you get customers to actually meet with you? Well, 
Well, again, I wasn't in sales at the time. I was always a kind of an SE or SE manager at the time. But um, so that wasn't wasn't really my job to get the meetings at that time. So the uh, the founders of the company um, had lots of connections. Uh, we were in the in the CPU design space, and there's not that many CPU design companies today or even back then. Back then it was Intel and AMD. And that's pretty much what it is now. Uh, um, so there weren't too many too many targets to go after. You kind of knew who your customers were, and the founders of the company I was at came from the CPU design industry, and they had some contacts. So. We weren't totally starting from from nothing. We had some contacts from our founders. All right, sounds good. All right, uh, well, I guess it is time to move on to the not so fire round, which you mentioned you listened to the show, so you uh, uh, you might know what's already coming. So, uh, what are a couple of essential tools that an SE should be using other than uh, a note taking tool? Um. Personally, I use a notebook and paper. Um, sometimes I use my laptop, but I think a laptop can be distracting. And, and also when you flip up the top of your laptop, you're kind of creating a barrier between you and the customer. Um, so I like, I like taking old fashioned notes on, on a pen and paper. I also like going to the whiteboard um, or having the customer join me at the whiteboard and and write things on the whiteboard, and then you just take a picture of the of the board with your with your with your cell phone camera. So um, I am jealous though of people who publish their meeting notes five minutes after the meeting's over because they've already written them in the meeting. Um, and if I want to do that, I need to I need to transcribe them from my from my notebook. But um, that's a trade off, and I think I think the process of writing of, of writing <laughs> writing by hand. And then if you're going to um, summarize your, your, your notebook into an email or meeting notes, that process reinforces your digestion of it and reinforces um, your memory and, and what you learned during that meeting. So it takes a little longer, but I think, um, I think it's a good strategy for me. So uh, for internal use, I usually use uh, Evernote to take a picture of my notes. Yep. And it just goes on Evernote and it's searchable. But yeah, for customer, like if I want to send the, the customer a summary, I usually have to transcribe what I wrote down. Okay. So uh, is there a book or resource that you would recommend every SE to read? So like some of your past guests, um, I'm a big fan of audio books. Um, I, even though Silicon Valley's is dense and customers are close. Uh, there's a lot of traffic and I'm in the car a lot. Um, so I, I do listen to a lot of audio books. Um, the sales book I like the best, and it's been mentioned on your show before, is, um, is Spin Selling by, by Neil Rackham. And the reason I like that one so much is because it, it's derived from empirical data where they go out and they observe all these sales teams and Observe what observe what happened, and it kind of makes the sales process somewhat scientific, which appeals to my engineering background. So they'll say, uh, so many uh, x percentage of the time when someone makes a, a claim, it's followed by a customer objection. Um, and so I just remember listening to that audiobook and having that author's uh, the narrator's voice in my head for months. <laughs> So even even today, uh, eighteen years later, when I go to a meeting, I, I I'm I'm thinking about um, what I do is going to prompt the objection from from the customer, depending on how I uh, how I state something. So I think that's a good book. Okay. So uh, and I think the reason I approached you about doing this podcast was because I didn't I didn't have this when I was when I was in SE, and I think this is this is awesome. I love the fact that you you summarize the podcast. Um, so you, you can kind of read what's going to be in the podcast and then you can, you can skip through the podcast to see, to, you know, to read the bits that, to hear the bits that you're interested in. So it's really cool. Thank you. Uh, 
I did this because there isn't any resources out there for SEs. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, uh, to go back to the books, the, the problem that I find with sales books or SE books, there isn't an audio book that for every sales book out there. Like maybe so spin selling has an audio book, but the rest I haven't found audio books for other sales best books. So we have to do it the old fashioned way and actually read. Who does that anymore? <laughs> So, uh, okay, third question. You work with one SE at a time, right? You're paired with one SE. Um, that's the model I have right now, but I've, I've had different models over time. Okay, so how do you manage your time and how would you like the SE to manage your time? And is there any uh, tips and tricks for time management that you'd recommend? Um, currently, my um, my organization uses Salesforce, and so I we we just do a lot of things through Salesforce. It's good because it has a record of it. Um, so I um, there's a way to create um, tasks and list of tasks, and so we communicate through that about what things should be done uh, for which customers. Um, and then we also use Outlook, which I think is pretty common. So we uh, we send each other calendar invites to block out things on our calendar. Even if I'm not going to every meeting with the SE or vice versa, we send each other our invites so we know where each other are going to be. Um, so if I need to schedule my SE for a meeting, um, I see a stuff on my calendar or I can bring up his calendar and see what's, what's available. Um, we meet once a week to go through. I, I also have an FSE for my region. So the three of us meet every week. Uh, Monday morning, and we go through the uh, the priorities for the week, any meetings or events, um, what our priorities are for the week, where should we focus our time on? Uh, two questions. Could you define what an FSE is? And, uh, um, and my current employer, FSE, is is a uh, is a field support engineer. So that's uh, their job is to focus on um, post sales current customers where the where the SE tends to tends to focus on pre-sales and, and new opportunities okay. but when you're when you have a fixed territory with a fixed number of accounts um, it's kind of a blurry distinction between what's pre-sales and what's post sales um, the same customers you have are going to probably buy something else from you so it's not always a clear line between what's pre-sales and post sales yeah, I, I go through that. So, uh, how do you feel about your SE blocking a certain amount of time each week for uh, learning more about the products that you guys sell? I love it. Um, that happened this week, um, and it's it, it's something that you have to do. Um, you know, so um, I always I always um, tell people on my team to, if there's training coming up, to block it out and make sure you, you know, plan out a week or two because tomorrow is always bad. There's always some something you already had planned or there's some crisis that you have to go tomorrow. But if you block it out ahead of time and say, okay, next Wednesday, I'm in this kind of training for half a day or to study this for half a day, I'm blocking it out. That's my sacred time. I can't, um, I can't be interrupted. We can schedule around that. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a common strategy to do, kind of block out your time for certain activities. I know for sales guys, uh, no sales guy likes to do cold calling or, you know, sending out emails to prospects. But I find that I used to block out like Wednesday and Friday mornings from, from nine to noon and say, that's my cold calling time. I'm, I'm not going to do anything else. Um, it's too easy to say, oh, I'd rather go do this instead of do cold calling. Um, but if you make this time sacred and say, okay, I'm going to focus on these tasks during these hours, and that's a good strategy rather than being reactive and cold calling always falls at the bottom of the list. So what if a customer tells you he wants, uh, like a known customer tells you he wants to meet during the time block you have for uh, cold calling? Do you accept or do you push them off? It depends. I mean, if I'm at if, if I'm at the startup, 
um, where I have no customers yet, and I have a customer who wants to meet with me, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna reschedule the cold calling. Um, but if it's an existing customer that I, I tend to see quite often anyway, I may ask them to move it to the afternoon or the next day or something. It, it's a judgment call, but um, it depends on what the what the priorities for, are for your for your current job and your current company. Okay. That's a good question, though. Okay. Uh, all right. So the final question, or before, I have two more questions for you. So, what advice would you give NSE who wants to move into sales that you feel they don't get from anybody else? I would. I would say, take control of your career path because you're the only one um, because it's most important to you and no one else is going to do it for you and it's a very personal thing and you need to decide what you want to do and I think the best way of doing that is to is to find a peer group or a mentor to to help guide you and to bounce out, bounce ideas off of so when I when I did move into sales that sales manager that hired me um, he was a, he was my mentor for a very long time, even after I left that company. And actually, he's one of the guys who became a CEO of a company. Um, so for him, career path was very important, and he always talked to me about career path and about about where you want to be, where you want to go, and what steps you need to take to get there. So I, I don't think I think there's very few managers. I don't know. There's I haven't had a lot of managers that really cared about my career path um, and it's something that you should care about and you should take time to think about and work on and, and, and kind of map it out where, where you like to be and where you think you need to go or what skills you need to get there and it's it's uh, it helps to have a mentor or peers you can bounce ideas off of and get feedback okay great uh, I have so many more questions uh, but I'll ask you this final one What's next for you? Are you going to be, are, are you, like people retire as SEs, all people also retire as salespeople. Actually, you retire faster as salespeople. What's next for you? Um, I'm at a point in my life where um, stability is important to me. Um, when I was at the startup, so I was younger and single and had no family or kids or a mortgage, um, all that's changed now. So. Um, I like, I'm, I'm more into stability now and, um, I can't be looking for a job every, every two years the way I used to be. So, um, what's next for me is, um, I'm, I'm not leaving Silicon Valley. This is, this is where I've worked most of my career. So, um, and I'm always, I'm still learning. So as long as I'm learning, I'm, I'm going to stay where I am, um, I like the ability, I like the option or the ability to mentor people and um, people who are coming up like, like doing this podcast and website and I like to mentor people on my team. Um, so I like to share what I've learned and share my experiences. So I'm, um, I'm happy where I am. Um, I, I'm not planning to make any big changes and uh, I, I want to get back at this point in my career. All right. Awesome. That's great. And uh, that's that's all I have for you today, Bob. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you reaching out to me and you w wanting to help as many people as possible. Thank sure, you. this has been fun. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. All right, we'll talk later then. Thank you. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Bob, for your time today. I really enjoyed my conversation with you. I I really want to understand what's next for SEs. Not that there should be a next. A lot of SEs are happy. We've already covered that. So for those who want to go into sales, I would highly recommend this podcast. And if you're here, that means you listen to it. So my recommendation is kind of moot. But thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your time. Hopefully you would have learned from Bob's experience as much as I have. It's like people always learn from their experience, but intelligent people learn from others, other people's experience as well, other people's mistakes. So... Thank you for listening. If you're finding this, 
If you're finding this information useful, valuable to you or to others, I know some of you are referring other people to the podcast, so please keep doing that. I appreciate that. Hopefully they appreciate it as well because we are. I am trying to help people. That's the bottom line. Providing value to you guys. If there are any topics that you guys want me to cover, reach out to me, let me know, so subscribe to the podcast. Whenever people subscribe, I usually get back to them within a short period of time and short is uh, debatable, but I usually get back to whoever subscribes, thanking them and asking them what they want to cover. So do that review rate, all that beautiful stuff. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And with that, this is Ramsey signing off.